I'm Peter Lee, and this is NewsBud's China Watch. This week, peace, America's unacceptable option in Korea, blood, the ISIS promise for China, and the world's ultimate WMD. First, Korea. The United States is publicly and painfully grappling with its North Korea policy options, war or negotiation. There was a big story in the New York Times on Saturday about how the U.S. had tried to sabotage the North Korean missile program, but bottom line, it hadn't worked so good. The nugget I found interesting was the inference that Kim Jong-un's execution of several security officials was linked to a U.S. sabotage campaign. I'm guessing Kim found out or suspected that the U.S. and South Korea had developed human assets to introduce malware into the North Korean computer systems. Human assets, a.k.a. spies, a.k.a. traitors, would be necessary since the North Korean systems are presumably air-gapped even more comprehensively than the Iranian ones that fell victim to Stuxnet. Long story short, somebody stuck in a thumb drive and some people got shot. The piece also indicated that the U.S. might consider putting nuclear weapons back into South Korea in order to increase the credibility of the U.S. deterrent. You might recall that President Obama flew some bombers over to South Korea from Guam last year that were characterized as nuclear capable. Reintroducing U.S. tactical nukes into South Korea would not of itself kill the negotiation track if, and it's a big if, Kim Jong-un doesn't retaliate with an ICBM test toward the United States. Other tests? Okay. On Sunday, the DPRK fired some medium-range missiles into the ocean, Japan Way, to protest a U.S. ROK joint military exercise, and the U.S. responded with the usual rhetoric. The New York Times report covered a lot of bases. It described the advances of the DPRK WMD programs. It acknowledged the shortcomings of the sabotage project. It also made the rather jaw-dropping official admission that our $300 billion anti-ballistic missile defense system doesn't really work. And it outlined the apparently insurmountable obstacles to the military option. Denuclearizing North Korea by force might involve quite a few collateral consequences. Maybe things like South Korea devastated by conventional and WMD retaliation, DPRK regime collapse, China moving troops into North Korea to occupy a buffer zone? This sorry scenario makes negotiation with the DPRK look pretty good. And China is trying to keep the ball rolling for negotiations between the U.S. and the DPRK as the Trump administration weighs its North Korean options. There was some speculation that China's cutoff of North Korean coal purchases was the PRC concession in negotiations over the famous Trump-Xi Jinping telephone call. You know, I will say the words one China, but you gotta give me something on North Korea. That seems pretty plausible to me. The Chinese would be happy to do it, since the coal sanctions push North Korea down the negotiation track. China's top foreign affairs guy, Yang Jiechi, is in Washington this week, apparently as part of the Chinese effort to keep things on the negotiation track despite the assassination of Kim Jong-nam. I think Yang Jiechi might run into some headwinds. Unfortunately, I'm not terribly optimistic about a Donald eats the burger or Trump goes to Pyongyang breakthrough, much as I'd like to see it. That's because the biggest loser if peace breaks out on the Korean peninsula is the United States, and the biggest winner would be China. One reason China supports negotiations is because China doesn't want a war and a failed state on its border. But China also wants negotiations because peace erodes the U.S. ROK military alliance. If relations with the DPRK are normalized, the U.S. ROK military alliance loses a big part of its mission. Is it going to be able to pivot, there's that word again, to a China containment mission? Sorry, no. Peace with North Korea will bring overwhelming Chinese diplomatic, political, and economic pressure on South Korea to downgrade the U.S. alliance. PRC pressure on the ROK is already pretty intense. We see this from China's anti-TAD campaign. TAD, 
the Theater High Altitude Area Defense Anti-Missile Battery, was supposed to be one of those super smart U.S. gambits that made delicious pivot lemonade out of a big security lemon, North Korea's emergence as a credible nuclear power. According to the traditional Pentagon cookbook, TAD was supposed to be a five-way Asian winner. Stand up to North Korea. Bind South Korea more closely to the U.S. Aggravate China. Demonstrate the indispensability of the United States in Asia and beef up the China containment military apparatus right on China's doorstep. The kicker was that this supposedly anti-DPRK missile battery came with a radar that could also be reconfigured to look 2,000 kilometers into China and get integrated into the U.S. Pacific anti-ballistic missile network. China's prolonged and determined pushback on TAD has been overt, intense, and unrelenting. Last week, Lottie, one of South Korea's big conglomerates swapped a piece of land with the South Korean military for the TAD site so local opposition could be sidestepped and construction could be fast-tracked. Now, the TAD battery is supposed to be up in three to four months instead of by the end of the year. This triggered a fresh round of Chinese retaliation. Lottie, which has $2.6 billion in China revenues, has found its web and brick-and-mortar retail operations in China under attack. Lade also operates duty-free stores in South Korea, and the PRC immediately cut back on the Chinese tour groups to Korea that provide those duty-free stores with 70% of their revenue. Lade's stock price promptly dropped 12%. There was head-scratching about, why is China being so gosh darn mean? Don't they understand they're alienating South Korean opinion, playing into the hands of the United States? Let me try to explain. The PRC under Xi Jinping is not afraid to appear on the Asian stage as mean China when it suits its purposes. This is one of those times. China's priority in Korea is to roll back U.S. hard power, not play soft power patty cake with the ROK. China is aggressively leveraging the fact of its existing economic ties to South Korea and the perception that South Korea's future is inextricably linked to China not to the United States. South Korea is vulnerable to Chinese pressure right now with the uncertainty and division surrounding the near total collapse of the Pak presidency and the U.S. inability to restrain the DPRK weapons programs and the dirty but pretty well-known secret that the TAD battery is close to useless as a meaningful defensive measure for South Korea. For China, it's not just a matter of short-term opportunities, it's a matter of long-term trends and tendencies the PRC intends to reinforce. China's objections to TAD are, I think, less related to the technical features of the system than to the fact that TAD symbolizes South Korea's hope that it can play the role of a U.S. ally and, at the same time, sustain its economic partnership with China. The TAD controversy has spilled over into the South Korean presidential campaign. Basically, every candidate, left or right, hopes to thread the needle by going ahead with Todd pronto while not cratering the Chinese relationship. That's not working too well. In a remarkably hawkish editorial in China's Global Times, the PRC asserted that South Korea is, quote, acting willfully and deploying TAD on its soil, betraying the cooperative logic in Northeast Asia, tying itself to the U.S. chariot and turning into an arrogant pawn of Washington in the latter's military containment against China. In other words, the PRC is saying there's no reason for South Korea to proceed with TAD or for the PRC to tolerate it. It's time for South Korea to recognize that its destiny lies in integration with China, not in lining up militarily against China with the United States. I think mean China is here to stay until South Korean politicians decide to degrade the U.S. alliance or, at the very least, stop upgrading it with things like TAD. China's desire to Finlandize South Korea puts an awkward spotlight on PRC promotion of negotiations between the U.S. and the DPRK. As China ups the pressure on South Korea concerning TAD, I think the U.S. will see the China element of the Korean equation more clearly, and China hawks will focus policymakers' attention on how peace with North Korea 
will weaken pro-U.S. political forces in the ROK and accelerate South Korea's drift into the arms of China. Peace with the DPRK may therefore turn out to be the one unacceptable option for the United States. Hopefully, we'll be able to muddle through instead. But what if Kim Jong-un closes the door on muddling through by test-firing ICBMs toward the United States? How about that war option that looks so terrible? The counterintuitive backstory of the war option is it's the option the Pentagon's pretty comfortable with. It would make a god-awful mess out of North Korea and maybe South Korea too. But look at Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria. That's America's core competency, starting fires thousands of miles from the homeland, putting them out, and restarting them with half-assed political solutions and perpetual resort to U.S. military power. In addition to helping the U.S. Army feel at home and useful and indispensable, flattening North Korea would close the door on the peace option for once and for all and maintain the status quo, where U.S. military power trumps Chinese economic power as the decisive factor on the peninsula. South Korea might not like it that way, but in the middle of an anti-WMD regional war fought under U.S. command, its opinion maybe isn't going to count for too much. So, if Donald Trump's political problems get severe enough that he wants a foreign war as a distraction, well, North Korea is teed up for him. When you get down to it, peace is the enemy of U.S. influence in Asia. Kind of funny. Kind of sad. Kind of scary. Speaking of scary, ISIS vowed a Chinese bloodbath. ISIS al-Farat, which apparently means ISIS of the Euphrates, meaning ISIS in Iraq, issued a half-hour video, which I have not seen in full. It apparently was the usual slick, creepy stuff of executions and exhortations. The China angle was that the featured fighters were Uyghurs, children as well as adults, and they promised to shed Chinese blood like rivers. As I explained in my January 11 China Watch broadcast, Uyghur fighters were probably imported into Syria, courtesy of Turkish intelligence services. When in Syria and Iraq, they apparently fragmented into two competing factions, one affiliated with the Turkestan Independence Party and Al-Qaeda, and another with ISIS. Since this was an ISIS Uyghur video, it criticized the Turkestan Independence Party, which is the most visible Uyghur militant outfit. Now, it looks like Syria and Iraq are winding down, Elijah Manier, who I consider the most credible observer of the region, predicts ISIS will be done there within a year. So, where are ISIS fighters going to go? One answer, possibly, is Libya. Another is North Africa, Boko Haram Way. A third is Yemen, where ISIS is apparently trying to muscle in on Al-Qaeda's action. But what about the ISIS Uyghurs, who don't speak Arabic? who, in some cases, apparently have their wives and children with them. Is Turkey going to try and reintegrate these groups into the Uyghur communities inside Turkey, which are apparently not terribly happy and contented places to start with? I tend to doubt it. The video implies that the ISIS Uyghurs want to move back to Asia, and it looks like ISIS, facing near extinction in the Middle East, is hoping that China, with its ill-treated Uyghur Muslim minority and its atheistic rulers, will offer a productive new recruitment slogan, battlefield success, and political traction for ISIS as it competes with Al-Qaeda both for fighters and for patronage as a jihadi asset. Taking jihad to the Chinese and taking it to the PRC are, however, two different things. Anti-PRC ISIS militants suffer from two disadvantages. The first is that there are not a lot of good havens around the PRC. The Islamic insurgency in the most obvious failing state refuge, Afghanistan, is dominated by the Afghan Taliban. China has been working with the Afghan Taliban for decades to keep a lid on Uyghur flight and Uyghur fighters. Undoubtedly, one objective of the Afghanistan peace process backed by China is to put the Afghan Taliban in the saddle in Kabul and in a better position to stamp out ISIS and Uyghur threats. The only ISIS group in Afghanistan, IS Khorasan province, is apparently clinging to some districts in eastern Afghanistan. Whether Uyghur fighters from Iraq and Syria could get there, and if they could improve the operational effectiveness of IS Khorasan enough to threaten Afghanistan 
the Afghan Taliban and the PRC is open to question. The other issue is mischievous state sponsorship. It is the dirty secret of jihadism that it usually flourishes not because it is self-sufficient, but because it can draw on the clandestine support of some state sponsor, the way allegedly the Salafist jihadis rely on support from Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. China is the largest purchaser of oil from Saudi Arabia and has major economic ties to the UAE. Neither of these states appear interested in sponsoring anti-China militants. Erdogan's Turkey seems to have been badly burned by its Syrian adventure and hopefully is out of the Uyghur business for now. That leaves India, which I think still lacks the reach to effectively support anti-China Islamic militants inside Afghanistan or other Central Asian states. The bottom line for the PRC, a worrisome threat with the possibility of some deadly attacks. But ISIS is probably not capable of sustaining an insurgency in Xinjiang. As I stated in my last China Watch episode, China is turning Xinjiang into one of the world's premier surveillance states, and ISIS will have its hands full trying to operate inside the PRC. For China, the main utility of the ISIS video may turn out to be supporting PRC efforts to heighten its threat narrative for Xinjiang. Further sideline, the Uyghur liberation narrative beloved by the Western media and governments and justify ever harsher methods inside China and increase demands for counterterrorism cooperation from its neighbors. The regional aspect of the ISIS threat is perhaps the most important here. There are other states in Asia that are less high functioning security states than the PRC. Places like Thailand, which saw a terrorist bombing in 2015, allegedly executed by Uyghur refugees. There's Indonesia, whose Islamic movement actually harbored some Uyghur militants that escaped from China. There's the Philippines, where the United States is warning slash threatening that Duterte's downgrade of the U.S.-Philippine security relationship puts it at risk of ISIS terrorism on Mindanao, perhaps ceded from Malaysia. Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, and the Philippines. All states with Muslim insurgencies, ISIS presence, large Chinese diasporas, and major economic links with the People's Republic of China. Rivers of Chinese blood may flow, in other words, but they may flow outside China. Finally, on a less than lighter note, the most dangerous weapon of mass destruction in the world is not the atomic bomb or VX nerve agent. It's this. Chickens in China have become a persistent reservoir for bird flu viruses. It used to be that wild fowl like ducks carried the viruses and it was hard to transmit to domestic fowl like chickens. Now, the flu virus has mutated and established itself securely in the chicken population. It happened in China because they've got a lot of ducks and a lot of chickens and a lot of chances for a breakthrough in transmission. It's currently the case that it's hard to transmit bird flu viruses from chickens to humans. But China has a lot of chickens and a lot of humans. You can see where this is headed. Last week, the World Health Organization looked at a nasty strain of bird flu, H7N9, that had emerged in China and made quite a few people sick. Had the virus figured out how to make the chicken to human jump more efficiently? The WHO and CDC are nervous about H7N9 mutations because that strain kills about 40% of the people who get sick enough to enter a hospital. And they're even more nervous about H5N1, which has been quiet for a few years, but kills about 60% of the people who end up in the hospital. If these bird flus start to spread more easily from chickens to people, a lot more people who hang around chickens are going to get sick and maybe die. Fortunately, that doesn't seem to have happened yet. The goodish news this week, yes, more people were getting bird flu, but no, it wasn't because chicken to human transmission had improved. It was just that a lot more chickens had bird flu and so more people were catching it. You are probably thinking, I don't spend a lot of time around live Chinese poultry, so it's not too likely I'll catch bird flu from a chicken. 
But what you should be thinking is, how likely is it that bird flu might figure out how to make the human to human jump? You know, transmission by sneezing, snot, and whatnot, so it could spread like wildfire through the human population around the globe instead of just relying on chickens to get around? Good question. Scary answer. Scientists have already identified a small number of mutations, maybe less than half a dozen, that would be needed to help H5N1 spread efficiently through human-human contact. Since science is wonderful, in 2012, researchers went ahead and confirmed their results by genetically engineering a modified virus that, in tests, successfully transmitted to a population of laboratory mammals. When it was proved that H5N1 could be genetically engineered and weaponized, the scientific community said, wait a minute, and publication and research were suspended for a year while tight biohazard controls were implemented. Trouble is, regardless of what the researchers were doing or not doing in the laboratory, the bird flu strains have been mutating and diversifying continually in the real world since they were identified in the 1990s. And now, they are mutating and diversifying in an enormous Chinese chicken population in close proximity to an enormous Chinese human population. So, every time bird flu develops a new wrinkle, the WHO and CDC anxiously scooch over for a look to see if this is the mutation that will explode into a global pandemic that kills millions of people. Last week, the good news was no. The new mutation was focused on killing chickens not jumping to humans or jumping from human to human. But sooner or later, the virus is going to hit the jackpot. Try to enjoy your Sunday chicken dinner. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to newsbud.com, where you'll find exclusive content available only to the Newsbud community. I'm Peter Lee for Newsbud's China Watch. For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the NewsBud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from NewsBud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from NewsBud's founder, Sibel Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at NewsBud.com.